guys and welcome back to another big out devlin video and today we're going to continue with our discussion of paganism though less of a discussion today and more simply a sit down and are you comfortable good because i'm going to read to you video <laughs> Now those of you who have followed me for a, a long time now um, will of course be aware that on the paganistic side of things I am actually in the process of writing my own poetic edders, uh, a telling of the stories of the original Britannic peoples um, as well as also bringing in some of the divine philosophies if you wish that we see not only within Britannic but also Norse belief systems also essentially marrying it up and leaving behind hopefully um, something that I can be proud of uh, and something that will help fellow pagans um, connect to what paganism is truly about however sometimes the poetic aspects even though that's the traditional manner in which to tell the stories are somewhat a little heavy something that sometimes can be a little bit harder to understand especially if you have no real prior knowledge to um, the actual stories being told so what i'm attending to do in this little series here is read to you translations from the original stories that were told within Ireland and Wales and other parts of Britannia at the time uh, when uh, the British Isles was of course pagan. I'll give you a little bit of a background also to some of the stories um, uh, from an historical perspective because of course these aren't just myth they are or, or you know or or religious beliefs if you wish they are actually historical accounts also these periods may of course be in the Dark Ages, doesn't mean things weren't um, recorded. It doesn't mean that the people themselves were backwards in any way. In fact, they were spiritually um, and uh, culturally very advanced, uh, perhaps even more so than we are today. In fact, in many ways we have taken a backward step. Anyways, that's another discussion. From now on in then guys, what I'll be doing is, as I say, reading to you some of the stories, some of the key stories from Irish and Welsh, from Irish and Welsh, Irish and Welsh, uh, Irish and Welsh, bear with me on my list there, it might be a little hard to understand me, but people from Ireland and Wales, basically their stories of and experiences of polytheism back in the days when polytheism was uh, the predominant, if not the only religion being practiced. And we're going to start the series off with three stories I've selected from the book of Invasions. And the three stories I've chosen to read to you uh, from that particular book are the quest of the children of Turian, the sorrow of Leah's children, and the wooing of Atean. Essentially, these stories begin just after the conquest of Philbolg by the Tuatha Devan, which was a, almost essentially a godlike race, whose name translates as the people of the god whose mother is Dana. From an historical uh, viewpoint the Tuatha Devan are recorded as having originally traveled to Erin which is essentially a part of Ireland from the northern islands of Greece around 2000 BC. They possessed or was said to possess great gifts of magic and also druidism and they ruled the country until their defeat by the Milesians which were essentially Iberian Celts that uh, originated from essentially modern-day Spain and Portugal. Now after this defeat, they were forced to establish an underground kingdom known as the Otherworld or the Scythe, meaning the Hollow Hills. And this is where we get our term for the Scythe. The Scythe is essentially um, a description of the highest ranking fairies within um, Old Britannic. Uh, belief systems and this is why the fairies are often believed to be the remnants of the followers or maybe even the gods of the original Tuatha Devan people. Aesive literally translating into the people of the mounds. The, the main hero of these three stories I'm going to read to you from the Book of Invasions, this will be over three videos at least by the way guys, is Lou of the Long Arm. 
who also appears later in the Ulster Cycle as Cocullian's Divine Father, emerging as one of, as I say, the principal heroes of the Tuatha de Ran, who rescues his people from the tyran tyranny of the Fomorians. The quest of the children of Turian, which is going to be as our sort of first story that we're going to read in this video, together with the sorrowful account of Lear's children, which is our second story, are undoubtedly undoubt two of the greatest epic tales within this cycle, and hence why I have chosen to, to read them from the Book of Invasions for you. The Rune of Etaean, which is the third story I'll be reading to you in our third video, concludes the, 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 the narrative of the beginning at least anyway and this was as a story probably written a little later than the others being written more so in the 8th century so as I say a little bit older than the others uh, and in here we see that the story unfolds after the people of Dano are dispossessed by the children of Maled and this is where we first see the notion of the land of youth or the other world being introduced which then of course becomes a very common theme throughout all of Britannic mythology and belief systems. And one last thing guys just before we do move on I do implore you to please check out my own poetic edders. Um, not all of it's available yet, obviously it's still being written up, but um, a couple of the verses of my poetic header do actually begin to handle and deal with some of these stories that you're about to hear. And the advantage of hearing them in poetic form is they give essentially artistic license to believers such as myself and practitioners to not only tell you the story, but hide between the lines and layer in ultimately the hidden knowledge and beliefs and interpretations that we have about these stories it turns it from a story into something greater you know um, something more spiritual i suppose you did could describe it as if you are interested guys go into my playlists um it's under the devil in edda playlist um and there will be cards um in the right hand corner of this video from time to time uh guiding you into where to go also if and only if you find that interesting and want to hear it um, from a different perspective so without further ado guys here is the story of the quest of the children of turian from the book of invasions noava of the silver hand rose to become king of the tuatha divan during the most savage days of the early invasions. The Fomorians, a repulsive band of sea pirates, were the fiercest of opponents who swept through the country destroying cattle and property and imposing tribute on the people of the land. Every man of the Tuatha Devan, no matter how rich or poor, was required to pay one ounce of gold to the Fomorians and those who neglected to pay this tax at the annual assembly on the hill of Hishnar were maimed or murdered without compassion. Baylor of the Evil Eye was the leader of these brutal invaders and it was well known that when he turned his one glaring eyeball on his foes they immediately fell dead as if struck by a thunderbolt. Everyone lived in mortal fear of Baylor, for no weapon had yet been discovered that could slay or even injure him. Times were bleak for the Tuatha Devan, and the people had little faith in King Nuava, who appeared powerless to resist Baylor's tyranny and oppression. As the days passed by, they yearned for a courageous leader who would rescue them from their life of wretched servitude. The appalling misery of the Tuatha Devan became known far and wide, and after time it reached the ears of Lou of the Long Arm of the Fairy Mounds, whose father was Cain, son of Caint. As soon as he had grown to manhood, Lou had proven his reputation of one of the most fearless warriors and was so revered by the elders of Fairyland that they had placed in his charge the wondrous magical gifts of Mananan the sea god who had protected their people for countless generations. Lou rode the magnificent white steed of Mananan, known as Aimvar, a horse as fleet of foot as the wailing gusts of winter, whose charm was such that no rider was ever wounded while seated astride her. He had the boat of Mananan, 
which could read a man's thoughts and travel in whatever direction its keeper demanded. He also wore Mananan's breastplate and body armor, which no weapon could ever pierce. And he carried the mighty sword known as the Retaliator that could cut through any battle shield. The day approached once more for the people of Dana to pay their annual taxes to the Fomorians, and they gathered together, as it was customary, on the hill of Hishnar to await the arrival of Baelor's men. As they stood fearful and terrified in the chill morning air, several amongst them noticed a strange cavalry coming over the plain from the east towards them. At the head of this impressive group, seated high in command above the rest, was Lu of the Long Arm, whose proud and noble countenance mirrored the splendor of the rising sun. The king was summoned to witness the spectacle, and he rode forth to salute the leader of this strange army. The two had just begun to converse amiably when they were interrupted by the approach of a grimy looking band of men, instantly known to all as the Fomorian tax collectors. King Noava bowed respectively towards them and instructed his subjects to deliver their tributes without delay. Such a sad sight angered and humiliated Lu of the long arm, and he drew the king aside and began to reproach him. Why do your subjects bow before such an evil-eyed brood? he demanded. When they do not show you any mark of respect in return. We are obliged to do this, replied Noava. If we refused, we would be killed instantly, and our land has witnessed more than enough bloodshed at the hands of the Fomorians. Then it is time for the Tuatha Devan to avenge this great injustice, replied Lu, and with that he began slaughtering Baylor's emissaries single-handedly until all but one lay dead at his feet. Dragging the surviving creature before him, Lu ordered him to deliver a stern warning to Baylor. Return to your leader, he thundered, and inform him that he no longer has any power over the people of Dana. Lu of the Long Arm, the greatest of warriors, is more than eager to enter into combat with him if he possesses enough courage to meet the challenge. Knowing that these words would not fail to enrage Baylor, Lu lost little time preparing himself for battle. He enlisted the king's help in assembling the strongest men in the kingdom to add to his own powerful army. Shining new weapons of steel were provided and three thousand of the swiftest white horses were made ready for his men. A magnificent fleet of ships designed to withstand the most venomous ocean waves remained moored at port awaiting the moment when Baylor and his malicious crew would appear upon the horizon. The time finally arrived when the king received word that Baylor's fierce army had landed at Es Dara, on the northwest coast of Kana. Within hours, the Fomorians had pillaged the lands of both the Red and plundered the homes of noblemen throughout the province. Hearing of his wanton destruction, Lu of the Long Arm was more determined than ever to secure victory for the Tuatha Devan. He rode across the plains of Erin back to his home to enlist the help of Cain, his father who controlled all the armies of all the fairy mounds. His two uncles, Ku and Kefen, also offered their support and the three brothers set off in different directions to round up the remaining warriors of Fairyland. Cain journeyed northwards and he did not rest until he reached Mag Mufulem on the outskirts of Dungdok. As he crossed the plain, he observed three men, armed and mailed, riding towards him. At first, he did not recognize them, but as they drew closer, he knew them to be the sons of Turian, whose names were Brian, Ichuraba, and Itcha. A long-standing feud had existed for years between the sons of Kent and the sons of Turian, and the hatred and enmity they felt towards each other was certain to provoke a deadly contest. Wishing to avoid an unequal clash of arms, Cain glanced around him for a place to hide and noticed a large herd of swine grazing nearby. He struck himself with a druidic wand and changed himself into a pig, 
Then he trotted off to join the herd and began to root up the ground like the rest of them. The sons of Turian were not slow to notice that the warrior who had been riding towards them had suddenly vanished into thin air. At first they all appeared puzzled by his disappearance, but then Brian, the eldest of the three, began to question his younger brothers knowingly. Surely brothers, you also saw the warrior on horseback, he said to them. Have you no idea what became of him? We do not know, they replied. Then you are not fit to call yourselves warriors, chided Brian, for that horseman can be no friend of ours if he is cowardly enough to change himself into one of these swine. The instruction you received in the City of Learning has been wasted on you if you cannot even tell an enchanted beast from a natural one. And as he was saying this, he stroked Ichabar and Itcher with his own druidic wand, transforming them into two sprightly hounds that howled and yelped impatiently to follow the trail of the enchanted pig. Before long, the pig had been hunted down and driven into a small wood where Brian cast his spear at it, driving it clean through the animal's chest. Screaming in pain, the injured pig began to speak in a human voice and begged his captors for mercy. Allow me a dignified death, the animal pleaded. I am originally a human being, so grant me permission to pass into my own shape before I die. I will allow this, answered Brian, since I am often less reluctant to kill a man than a pig. Then Cain, son of Cain, stood before them with blood trickling down his cloak from the gaping wound in his chest. I have outwitted you, he cried, for if you had killed me as a pig, you would only be sentenced for killing an animal, but now you must kill me on my own human shape and I must warn you that the penalty you will pay for this crime is far greater than any ever paid before on the death of a nobleman, for the weapons you shall use will cry out in anguish, proclaiming your wicked deed to my son, Lou, of the long arm. We will not slay you with any weapons in that case, replied Brian triumphantly, but with the stones that lie upon the ground around us, and the three brothers began to pout Cain with jagged rocks and stones until his body was a mass of wounds, and he fell to the earth, battered and lifeless. The sons of Turian then buried him where he had fallen in an unmarked grave and hurried off to join the war against the Fomorians. With the great army's fairyland and the noble cavalcade of King Noava at its side, Lou of the Long Arm won battle after battle against Bailor and his men. Spears shot savagely through the air and scabbards clashed furiously until at last the Fomorians could hold out no longer. Retreating to the coast, the terrified survivors and their leader boarded the vessels and sailed as fast as the winds could carry them back through the northern mists towards their own depraved land. Lou of the Long Arm became a hero of his people and they presented him with the finest trophies of valour the kingdom had to offer, including a golden war chariot studded with precious jewels which was driven by four of the brawniest milk-white steeds. When the festivities had died down somewhat and the Tawatha Divan had begun to lead normal lives once more, Lou began to grow anxious for news of his father. He called several of his companions to him and appealed to them for information, but none amongst them had received tidings of Sedan since the morning he had set off towards the north to muster the armies of the fairy mounds. I know that he's no longer alive, said Lou, and I give you my word that I will not rest again or allow food or drink to pass my lips until I have knowledge of what happened to him. And so Lou, together with a number of his kinsmen, rode forth to the place where he and his father had parted company. From here, the horse of Mananan guided him to the plain of Murphyem, where Cain had met his tragic death. As soon as he entered the shaded wood, the stones on the ground began to cry out in despair. And they told Lou of how the sons of Turian had murdered his father and buried him in the earth. Lou wept bitterly 
when he heard this tale and implored his men to help dig up the grave so that he might discover in what cruel manner Cain had been slain. The body was raised from the ground and the litter of wounds on his father's cold flesh was revealed to him. Lou rose gravely to his feet and swore angry vengeance on the sons of Turian. His death has so exhausted my spirit, I cannot hear through my ears, and I cannot see anything with my eyes, and there is not one pulse beating in my heart for grief of my father. Sorrow and destruction will fall on those that committed this crime, and they shall suffer long when they are brought to justice. The body was returned to the ground, and Luke carved the headstone and placed it onto the grave. Then, after a long period of mournful silence, he mounted his horse and headed back towards Tara, where the last of the victory celebrations were taking place at the palace. Lou of the Long Arm sat calmly and nobly next to King Noava at the banqueting table and looked around him until he caught sight of the three sons of Turian. As soon as he had fixed his eye upon them, he stood up and ordered the cane of attention of the court to be shaken so that everyone present would fall silent and listen to what he had to say. I put to you all a question, said Lou. I ask each of you what punishment you would inflict upon the man that had murdered your father. The king and his warriors were astonished at such words, but finally Noava spoke up and inquired whether it was Lou's own father that had been killed. It is indeed my own father who lies slain, replied Lou, and I see before me in this very room the men who carried out this foul deed. Then it would be too far a lenient punishment to strike them down directly, said the king. I myself would ensure that they died a lingering death, and I would cut off each single limb each day until they fell down before me writhing in agony. Those who were assembled agreed with the king's verdict, and even the sons of Turian nodded their heads in approval. Lud declared that he did not wish to kill any of the Tuatha Devan, since they were his own people. Instead, he would insist that the perpetrators pay a heavy fine, and as he spoke, he stared accusingly towards Brian, Ucha, and Utraba so that the identity of the murderers was clearly exposed to all. Overcome with guilt and shame, the sons of Turian could not bring themselves to deny their crime, but bowed their heads and stood prepared for the sentence Lou was about to deliver. This is what I demand of you, he announced. Three ripened apples, the skin of a pig, a pointed spear, two steeds and a chariot, seven pigs, a whelping pup, a cooking spit, and three shouts on a hill. And Lou added, if you think this fine too harsh, I will now reduce part of it. But if you think it's acceptable, you must pay it in full, without variation, and pledge your loyalty to me before the royal guests gathered here. We do not think it too great a fine, said Brian. Nor would it be too large a compensation if you multiplied it a hundredfold. Therefore we will go out in search of all these things you have described and remain faithful to you until we have brought back a each and every last one of these objects. Well now, said Lou, since you have bound yourselves before the court to a quest assigned to you, perhaps you would like to learn more detail of what lies in store and he began to elaborate on the tasks that lay before the sons of Turian. The apples I have requested of you, Lou continued, are the free apples of the Hesperides, growing in the gardens of the eastern world. They are the colour of burnished gold, and have the power to cure the bloodiest wound or the most horrifying illness. To retrieve these apples, you will need great courage. For the people of the East have been forewarned that three young warriors will one day attempt to deprive them of their most cherished possessions. And the pig skin I have asked you to bring me will not be easy to obtain either. 
for it belongs to the king of Greece, who values it above everything else. It too has the power to heal all wounds and diseases. The spear I have demanded of you is the poisoned spear kept by Tsar, king of Persia. This spear is so keen to do battle that its blade must always be kept in a cauldron of freezing water to prevent its fiery heart melting the city in which it is kept. And do you know who keeps the chariot and the two steeds I wish to receive from you? Luke continued. We do not know, answered the sons of Tullian. They belong to Dobar, king of Sicily, said Lu. And such is their unique charm that they are equally happy to ride over sea or land, and the chariot they pull is unrivaled in beauty and strength. And the seven pigs you must gather together are the pigs of Asal, king of the golden pillars. Every night they are slaughtered, but every morning they are found alive again, and any person who eats part of them is protected from ill health for the rest of his life. Three further things I demanded of you, Lou went on. The whelping hound you must bring me guards the palace of the king of Irud. Valenis is her name, and all the wild beasts of the world fall down in terror before her, for she is stronger and more splendid than any other creature known to man. The cooking spit I have called for is housed in the kitchen of a fairy woman on Innes Findiquir, an island surrounded by the most perilous waters that no man has ever safely reached. Finally, you must give me the free shouts requested of you on the hill of mid Cain, where it is prohibited for any man other than the sons of mid Cain to cry aloud. It is here that my father received his warrior training, and here that his death would be hard as felt. Even if I should one day forgive you of my father's murder, it is certain that the sons of mid Cain will not. As Lou finished speaking, the children of Turian were struck dumb by the terrifying prospect of all that had been achieved by them, and they went at once to where their father lived and told him of the dreadful sentence that had been pronounced upon them. It is indeed a harsh fine, said Turian, but one that must be paid for if you are guilty, though it may end tragically for all three of you. Then he advised his sons to return to Lu to beg the loan of the boat of Mananan that would carry them swiftly over the seas on their difficult quest. Lu kindly agreed to give them the boat and they made their way towards the port accompanied by their father. With heavy hearts they exchanged a sad farewell and wearily set sail on the first of many arduous journeys. Okay guys, I'm just going to end it there. So there is going to be a part two to this video. Uh, it is getting quite long. Um, there's not a huge amount left. I could carry on, but I don't want to overwhelm you so much with uh, too much information. So I'm going to end it there. But as you can see, it's quite a captivating story and one with twists and turns in it, as we'll see as the, as the story progresses, even more so than what we've already had. But it gives us a great foundation to work upon regards the, the, really the greatest insights are that of course the Irish people at this point in time were obviously very aware of the Mediterranean uh, peoples. The kings of Greece for example are mentioned, um, Sicily at one point is mentioned so both Italy and Greece is obviously there's some great deal of relationship between the original Irish people uh, and their culture and obviously the cultures of um, uh, Italy and Greece at the time. This, I mean, we do know anyway, there was trade between the two cultures, but it's nice to see it actually recorded within um, uh, ancient books also. Anyway, guys, I hope you're finding the story interesting and I hope you tune in for the next instalment. There isn't too much one uh, of this one left, to, as I say, to read, so it will be a shorter video um, upcoming and you won't have to wait too long for it either because these videos are quite quick and easy to make. In the meantime, guys, thank you for watching. I wish you a farewell, I hope you keep safe, and ta-ta, and goodbye for now.